Stefano to talk about uh, like black holes as dark matter, but actually Stefano works on a very broad range of topics uh, in astroparticle physics and uh, like just like tiny theoretical physics in general. So, so he actually also works on particle dark matter, and he has a, a graduate level textbook. That was born out of Tassie lectures. <laughs> <laughs> And he also works on like matter antimatter uh, like uh, asymmetries and uh, phenomenology of symmetry and extra dimensions. So many topics. Okay. So uh, without further ado, you, let's uh, welcome uh, Stefan to start the lesson. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I really look forward to knowing all of you. Um, it's, it's so great to be back here. Um, so yeah, my name is Stefano Profumo, and uh, I come from this country over here. I thought I'd introduce myself. Uh, my uh, hometown is here between truffles, pesto, and risotto, uh, <laughs> right around there. Uh, my alma mater is non-edible. Uh, it's pizza right here. <laughs> that uh, but my graduate studies alma mater is here in the prosciutto region of northeastern Italy. Uh, so yeah, I grew up there. Uh, I then moved uh, to the United States back almost uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I was for a few months a postdoc at Florida State uh, and then at Caltech for a couple of years before joining the faculty at UC Santa Cruz, and I've been very happy there ever since. Um, and I, uh, I, I do serve uh, in some uh, uh, more or less uninteresting administrative positions, as it happens with seniority, I guess. Um, but yeah, more to the, to the topic, what I work on, what I've uh, devoted many years on are two uh, big questions. One is what Juna uh, will and has been talking about, which is why there's more matter than antimatter in the universe. Of course, you know, there's always the solution of God made it that way, but you know, there's reasons to believe that with inflation, that's not such a great solution. So. We want to find a dynamical way to explain this, this tiny, but you know, anthropologically and anthropically very important asymmetry. Uh, and then uh, I, I uh, worry and think about uh, what the dark matter uh, is in the universe um, as, as a fundamental new uh, kid on the block of particle physics or not, uh, like we will talk in this uh, lecture series today. So uh, please, come introduce yourself. I really look forward to hearing what you guys are thinking about, what you work on, where you come from, uh, and what keeps you, uh, you know, up uh, at night and wake you up in the morning. Uh, and please do let me know if you ever come on the West Coast of the United States. I'd be delighted to, uh, to host you uh, in Santa Cruz, which, as Adi might testify, is a fantastic place in a redwood forest. Uh, very pretty indeed. Um, you know, I think the, the biggest value added to being here at TASI, for you as well as for me, is social networking, is knowing each other. Uh, you realize that, you know, you will grow together academically and personally. Uh, and so it's great to just get to know one score sort of on a worldwide scale. 
so really take advantage of, of social interactions, make connections, know each other, uh, personally and scientifically. You know, if, if there's one thing that I learned in my, in my career is how tremendously important within physics, and especially theoretical physics, uh, to know people, to be able to interact, to exchange ideas. Um, cool, so one more thing. Uh, I'm using slides, which is really not very kosher for TASI uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, I'm a lazy person. I'm Italian, very lazy. Um, but the second thing is that my handwriting is really quite awful. But I do promise to try to keep a pace that is uh, acceptable for you to take notes, try to process what I'm talking about in real time. Uh, but most importantly, feel free to interrupt me. Okay, so if, if the pace gets out of control, uh, and in some cases, I might make mistakes. Uh, C3PO famously declared that uh, even R2D2 is known for having been wrong in the past. So sometimes it happens. So please point that out. Uh, we are all here to learn. Uh, so good. So we're going to be talking in this lecture series mostly about, uh, about dark matter, which as other lecturers have, uh, I'm sure already pointed out, sort of ad nauseum, uh, is an ingredient that we believe is central to our understanding of primarily how structure forms in the universe uh, and for how structures appear in the late universe. And so galaxies like our own Milky Way, uh, you know, there's, there's very, very strong evidence are embedded in a large hill of dark matter that dominates the gravitational potential of the system. Uh, and in fact, I'm sure that lecturers last week and this week have emphasized that we have a pretty good idea of which fraction of the global, so universe-wide uh, matter uh, content of the universe is in the form of yet to be defined dark matter. So we'll try to define exactly what I mean by dark matter and exactly uh, uh, what we need for something to be um, the dark matter. So in fact, we know so well uh, about dark matter one thing in particular, which is how much there is. Uh, and the reason is that when it comes to the universe as a whole, we have fairly strong and fairly conclusive handles on a few things. One of them is uh, the total energy density. Another one is the total matter density. And a third one is the baryonic density in the universe, again, as a whole. So let me briefly remind you why that is, why we have such strong understanding of these various ingredients. Well, first of all, CMB data indicate quite conclusively that the universe is spatially flat, which means uh, in cosmology that the density, the total density of the universe is very close to critical. Okay, so we know what the total density is from the CMB from a, you know, with a, with a fairly large degree of certainty. Uh, so as Adi knows very well, I like to put numbers to statements. So what, what, what is our idea of critical density? So what is the critical density of the universe? Uh, sort of visually. So, you know, if I tell you that it's this combination of the Hubble constant and Newton's constant, it doesn't really mean much. Uh, if I tell you that it's 10 to the negative 29 grams per centimeter cube, also, I don't understand 10 to the negative 29. That's a very small number, I understand that. But in practice, what is it? So, uh, so let's wrap our mind around this very small number. Uh, let's think about 1 GeV. 1 GeV is the mass of a proton. And to understand that number in units of how many protons there are in an amount of space that I do understand, uh, you get to think that 1 GeV uh, is essentially 1 over Avogadro's number grams of matter, right? Because it takes an Avogadro number of protons to get one gram of hydrogen, right? And so 10 to the negative 24 grams is one GeV or one proton. And so 10 to the negative 29 is about you know, 10 protons. If you're putting the right numbers, it turns out it's five protons per cubic meter, five single protons per cubic meter. Now that's 
that's a spectacularly low density, right? Five protons per cubic meter. Uh, do you know off the top of your head what the density inside the Milky Way is? Yes. Yeah, it's about 0.3 GV per centimeter cube. So you've got, a, you know, one proton every three centimeter cube. So it's a density that is, you know, five to six orders of magnitude larger than that. That tells you how nonlinear the universe is. And this truly is the reason why we need dark matter. We need dark matter for the density perturbations in the early universe, which we know at CMB were very tiny, very, very tiny, to grow fast enough. So dark matter makes the universe happen in time. That's a good way to think about it. It makes the universe happen in time, right? Absent dark matter, stars would have a much harder time to form. Galaxies would look much, much younger than they are and so on. The universe would look a lot younger. So, you know, dark matter what is what makes your hair gray. Yes? Uh, if we were able to observe the cosmic neutrino background, would we be able to put tighter bounds on um, the flatness of the universe? Uh, no, I don't think so. The CMB really gives, so let me, let me put it in figure. Uh, so the CMB gives you this, this sliver here. So it's not exactly flat, but it's very, very close to flat. So the cosmic neutrino background, um, that's a good question. How would the cosmic neutrino background measurement uh, appear on a plot like this? So what is this plot, first of all? This is a plot of contours in the plane of the dark energy density relative to critical and the matter energy density relative to critical. Okay. And so there are some probes. This, this green sliver here uh, has to do with clusters. And clusters are a great way to measure how much matter there is in the universe. So th this is why this sliver is almost vertical. Uh, these are supernovae, which are quite sensitive to the acceleration of the universe, as you've heard. And so that's why this looks a little bit more tilted. Actually, this is supernovae as well. And this, again, is CMB. Now, the cosmic neutrino background. Uh, so how would we measure it? Well, that's, that's a different question. Let's suppose that we find a way to measure it. Uh, and so we measure a flux of neutrinos. OK, so first of all, Absent a measurement also of the neutrino masses, I think that would really help you on this plot. Uh, if, in a magical world, uh, you had a way to, at the same time, determine uh, and the this die is, oop, okay, and the flux in the cosmic neutrino background, what you would know is cosmology up to the neutrino freeze out. Now, the neutrino freeze out, uh, and I'm not going to get into that detail, uh, is, is a beautiful classic thermal freeze out history uh, of a hot relic, so something that freezes out what relativistic. And that happens almost unavoidably at one mega electron volt. So the reason why I don't think it would add much to this plot is that we already know what cosmology looked like up to one MeV from BBN. So I don't think it would add much to the picture of cosmology other than something I'll, I'm going to talk about next, which is how much neutrinos contribute to the dark matter. So that for sure, yeah. Why is the CMB measurement truncated here? Because, you know, error bars are a fact of life. No matter how precisely you measure things. Well. In principle, it is, uh, you know, it is a novel as well. But, uh, yeah, let's see. So I don't, I don't know why it's truncated at omega matter equals 1. There might be a theory prior that just says you cannot overclose the universe. And so in principle, I think that would be an ellipse. But the center of the ellipse might already be past the omega matter equals 1. Um, but, yeah. It, it should be an ellipse. There is a theory prior that tells you the matter density in the universe has to be subcritical. So I think that's what cuts the ellipse over there. Great question. Cool. So, um, so how do we weigh baryons? We, we said a little bit here how we weigh uh, omega matter, which is the total matter. Uh, but how do we weigh baryons? So there's fundamentally two ways. 
and probably you know folks have already talked about this. Uh, one angle is a pretty direct measurement of the baryon density that comes from matching the abundance of light elements synthesized in the early universe with observations. So you have theoretical bands because once you know the nuclear reaction network that produces each one of the light elements that are synthesized in the early universe, then as a function of only one parameter, which is the relative density of baryons to photons, the so-called baryon to photon ratio, you can calculate, and these are the bands over here, uh, precisely what the abundance of each one of these elements should be. Then you compare with observations, and you come up with a vertical band that gives you an interval in the baryon density to photons. Now with CMB, of course, we measure very accurately the density of photons in the universe, and so that ratio gives you directly a direct measurement on the global number of baryons uh, in the early universe. Okay, and that's a picture of sort of floating baryons at BBN, and BBN, again, is roughly at one mega electron volt. This is a, and I'll get to your question. This is a beautiful example of a thermal freeze-out story. I'm sure last week people talked about, you know, uh, the freeze-out of dark matter as a thermal species. This is the paradigm that made us take very seriously this idea that, you know, maybe cold dark matter emerged as a thermal relic from the early universe. Yes, there was a question somewhere over there, maybe disappeared. Okay, good, no questions. So that's, that's probe number one when it comes to measuring the global number of baryons in the universe. Probe number two utilizes the uh, angular power spectrum of temperature and isotropies in the CMB. And so here's the idea. The idea is, as you change, as you change the density of baryons, you change the shape of these features in the angular power spectrum as a function of angular scale. So this L, a, a rough, again, number mnemonic, is 60 divided by L is the angle in degrees that these, uh, these sort of uh, angular features correspond to. So anyways, uh, what is shown here is what happens as you dial the baryon density from 0 to 0 0.06 in units of the critical density. Uh, actually, it's h squared. h is about 0.7, so h squared is about 0.5. So there's a factor of 2 there. Don't, never mind. The key point is that you have opposite effects on odd and even acoustic peaks as you dial up and down the baryonic density. That's very interesting. So as you dial it up, the first and the third acoustic peak, you see they become greener. So you, 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 you sort of emphasize the importance of the odd peaks, and you de-emphasize concurrently the importance of the even peaks. Right, so that's, that's beautiful because you all remember the Planck measurements of this spectrum of angular, uh, uh, of angular temperature and isotropies. Uh, they're tiny, they're very, very tiny. And so that's why the CMB is so good to measure directly omega baryon. Okay, so the second, oh, yes, Adi. It, it is not a two minutes explanation, but I can, I can explain to you in detail why the odd, it, it's sort of, you know, these are sort of acoustic oscillations. And so, you know, it, it, it basically corresponds to compressions and depressions in the matter photon fluid. Uh, and so you can imagine as you crank up uh, the baryons, which are essentially the species, the matter species, which is coupled to the photons, you emphasize and de-emphasize the importance of compressions and Impressions in the fluid. So in two words, that's the reason. So the second thing that happens is when you change the matter content of the universe, so when you add more sort of uh, what we call matter here is non-relativistic species which have essentially vanishing pressure. Okay, when you think about matter, it's non-relativistic, so very, very low pressure, pressure less fluid. Okay, so what happens is and, and this is a little bit easier to understand. You just smush down the density perturbations, right? Because you create more inertia in your fluid as you crank the total amount of matter. So this is dark matter plus baryons. And so the combination of these two basically tell you precisely what uh, the density of baryons in the universe is. And so let's use 
the same sort of understandable units of, um, of you know, GV per centimeter cube. Uh, and so in GV per centimeter cube, row critical is, uh, again, 50 times center negative 7 or 5 protons per meter cube. Uh, the density of baryons is, as you can see, is what? Like 5%, 5% of the critical density. Yes? Um, I actually have a question about your, your last slide. That's like yeah. the plot that you were showing. Mm -hmm. um, do the peaks all scale down by the same amount? Uh, no, you can see by eye that they don't. Mm -hmm. So the first peak is really depressed. Mm -hmm. The second peak a little bit less, and then as you peer out. So on a relative scale, I also don't think they get scaled down by the same fraction. Uh, yeah, I think the lower L peaks get squished down more. But that's a, that's a very good question. And yeah. is that kind of because of the inertia that you were talking about? Like yeah. Scales, that is going to matter more? Yeah. So, uh, so the way you think about these high L peaks are smaller and smaller angular regions in the sky. And so, yeah, and so, you know, somehow you have to imagine, uh, you have to imagine an effect that macroscopically, so on larger angular scales is, is more important, but as you shrink the angular scale, it, it kind of, you know, it's less influenced by the fact that you have more inertia to the fluid itself. Gotcha. Yeah, cool. So in units of the critical density, the bottom line here is that baryons are, you know, 4.9 and change of critical, and the cold dark matter is about a fourth of critical, no h squared here. Okay, so that's as good as the particle data group reports it today. So that's as good as it gets uh, in terms of uh, measurements of baryons and cold dark matter. So this is important for the story I'm gonna tell you guys because uh, what this tells you is that any baryonic form of dark matter any baryonic form of dark matter can at most contribute 20% to the total amount of dark matter. Okay, because we have this roof that baryons cannot be more than 20%. And we know that very, very well uh, from BBN and CMB. So, you know, whatever behaves like dark matter today, which is made of baryons, think for instance planets, right? Planets are a pressureless fluid. They move slowly. They you know, they don't have any pressure. Uh, they are dark matter. They behave like dark matter today. Uh, black holes, and not the black holes I'm going to mostly talk about in this set of lectures, but astrophysical black holes, the end points of uh, gravitational collapse of stars, those are also dark matter. Those are part of the dark matter. And we're going to calculate how many, uh, what fraction of dark matter they are. Uh, brown dwarfs, matches, which are uh, massive uh, complex halo objects. Uh, all of this stuff, at most we know, contributes up to 20%. Uh, and in fact, we know that they cannot contribute anywhere close to 20%. And the reason why that is, is plots like this. So what, what is shown here is the following, is measurements in clusters of galaxies so roughly speaking, how, how, do people know how large the Milky Way is in solar masses, total mass of the Milky Way, more or less? 10 to the 11 is sort of a, a little underestimate. So including the dark matter halo, you're closer to 10 to the 12 solar masses. So these are objects that contains hundreds to thousands uh, galaxies like the Milky Way, so very large clusters of galaxies. And so the measurement is uh, how much gas there is in the inner cluster medium, so how much gaseous gas there is in these systems uh, as a fraction of, uh, of you know, the total baryon density, this green light is a total baryon density, versus stars. So stars are less and less important contributors to massive clusters of galaxies, while the ISM gas, which is essentially baryons that are not bound into stars, baryons that don't behave like the dark matter, that fraction grows and it gets, you know, for the largest system, pretty much really close to being the totality of the baryons. So that is to say that most of the baryons in the universe are in the form of gas, and a lot of this gas 
uh, you know, is what makes up the bulk of the mass of clusters. Yes. Um, how do you astrophysicists get a measurement of that gas? Is it emission absorption spectra? So, you know, I'm lucky here because my wife is actually an X-ray astronomer, and so that's exactly her line of business. So I've sort of overheard these a couple of times. Uh, and so the way they do is the following. So under some thermodynamical assumptions on what the gas does uh, in a cluster of galaxies, uh, such as hydrostatic equilibrium. So if the system is in hydrostatic equilibrium, what they do with X-ray telescopes is they actually take the temperature of the gas. So the temperature is in one and one, one to one correspondence with the depth of the gravitational potential well of the cluster. So you have a measurement of the mass of the cluster. You have other measurements, like with lensing, that tell you how massive a cluster is. Uh, and a combination of the gas temperature, so it, how hot the gas is, how it's being heated by being inside this gravitational potential well, uh, versus other measurement of the total mass of the cluster gives you the ability to put a point on that plot. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and of course, stars you sort of measure directly with optical telescopes. So, uh, so that's pretty interesting because it tells you that you know, most of the bariums are actually not confined into stuff that behaves like dark matter. And that's pretty critical because you know, for a long time, people were like, yeah, it's probably like you know, Jupiter's giant planets that orbit galaxies that behave exactly like dark matter that were formed from baryons, so there's no real problem. That, there is a problem. The problem is, number one, there's not enough baryons. Number two, most of the baryons do not behave like dark matter. We cool on this? All right. Good. So in this lecture series, I will focus on a class of candidates that I have found uh, in recent years to be pretty interesting. And I usually find things interesting just because uh, I get to learn new stuff that I didn't know before. There's a lot of rich physics that comes with thinking about black holes that are not born out of the gravitational collapse of a star, but out of something else. And in fact, in standard cosmology, these guys are bound to exist, are bound to be very, very rare. But in standard cosmology, there should be some primordial black holes. We'll, we'll see why and how many. Uh, and so one interesting thing about them is that they're not requiring anything new out of the particle content of the standard model. So you don't need a new particle. You just need large enough density perturbations in the early universe to collapse into these objects. Uh, and this is something, again, that is bound to happen in standard cosmology but not to the degree that would make it interesting for dark matter. However, if you do fiddle with the universe cosmology in ways that we will describe in great detail, you will be able to form enough of these primordial black holes. So there are many interesting reasons why these objects are phenomenologically interesting, so why they do cool things for you uh, to have fun with, uh, and I'll list them soon. Uh, but before getting there, let's just go back and look at this other non-exotic dark matter candidates. So for instance, um, you know, before getting there, uh, let's, let's remind ourselves again what we want from the dark matter. We want the dark matter to be uh, a pressureless uh, fluid, collisionless fluid. Uh, we want the dark matter to be around right now, because we do observe galaxies to be dominated by dark matter today. So dark matter cannot be a species that nicely seeds in the early universe density perturbations. No, we actually observe it today, so it has to be long-lived. It has to be dark, so it, it probably is not charged under electromagnetism in ways that it would make it easy to see the dark matter. Uh, and it should not carry color charge. And so I'm sure that a slide like this has appeared uh, you know, before uh, this lecture at, at this year's TASI. Uh, but if you think about these requirements, so for instance, no electromagnetic charge in one go eliminates you know, all of the leptons, uh, and of course the charge, uh, weak scale boson W, and the photon, uh, the fact that we want it to be long-lived rules out the Higgs, but also the Z boson, and the fact that the dark matter cannot be colored basically only lives one class of candidates, 
which is neutrinos. So neutrinos are there. They have a mass. We know neutrinos have a mass. We know exactly how to calculate their abundance in the early universe from a cosmic neutrino background. So the cosmic neutrino background abundance is linearly uh, producing a, an abundance of neutrinos, of relic neutrinos. This scales linearly with the mass of the neutrinos. And we know that at least two neutrinos are massive. I see your hand, Daddy. Just give me one second. Uh, because we measure neutrinos oscillations. Right? And so we have at least two mass differences in the neutrino sector, one related to atmospheric neutrinos, which, again, to have numbers, it's roughly the, you know, the square root of 2 times 10 to the negative 3. These are mass differences. So you know, one out of three neutrinos can be massless, but at least two are guaranteed to be massive. Okay? And, and, and one is a lot more you know, massive than the other, unless there's some hierarchy. Yes, Adi? we started knocking out a bunch of the standard model particles based on various things, but we can construct representations which, from those that are not charged under uh, certain things like that, right? And so what knocks, is there like a general statement that knocks all of those representations out as well? So uh, for a presentation, you, you probably what you have in the back of your mind is something like a composite state. Something like that. Right. Because, you know, a high representation, say, of color charge, which is something that I've thought about. It's not going to work. So uh, you, you want something that is color neutral, but it also does not really have any color at all. So that doesn't interact strongly, right? Uh, there are very strong limits on strongly interacting parts. So all of these limits actually are sort of bound in certain mass regimes. So if the dark matter particle is a composite, uh, is very massive, but it does carry electromagnetic charge, then it's totally fine, right? Because as long as the, ma the, the mass of the particle is very large, it can carry that. What you actually constrain is the ratio of charge to mass. And the same is true for strong interactions. So, you know, one should qualify this by saying that if that is the mass scale, you know, if, if, if these composites have a mass scale that is not too dissimilar, from uh, the masses of standard model particles, then the statement is strictly true. But if they're very large composites, then yes, you can have, you know, smart people like Ed Witten has talked about composites made up of a bunch of strange quarks called strangelets. That's a fine dark matter candidate. If the strangelet is a very, very macroscopic, uh, you know, much larger than the Avogadro number of strange quarks, then you are more or less fine. And, and the reason why you're fine is that it, the dark matter is so heavy that it's very rare that it passes through Earth. So it's not that we cannot see it. It's just that there's very few of these objects around. Uh, and so it's just by uh, you know, a suppression of the number of events per unit time that you win. Yes? Can we, how would you produce this strange look? So um, Witten's idea was that we don't really know, we don't really understand you know, the, the QCD effective potential. So, you know, it's, it's, already, quite, it's already unknown in, in principle uh, which bound states of quarks are stable. Like take pentaquarks, you know, are they stable? Is there anything besides pentaquarks that, that give you, you know, uh, a stable configuration of strong interacting particles? So Witten said that maybe in the limit of very, very large uh, number densities, uh, there's a collective effect that makes the potential, you know, low enough to be confining. Uh, and so, you know, that's essentially speculation. Uh, but, you know, there are some sort of theoretical reasons that underpinned the choice of the strange quark. Uh, and, and, you know, if that's the case, then you can imagine that early uh, in the history of the universe, there might be a mechanism that leads to the formation of these stable QCD composites. Yeah. Um, so I know that there's a, a little bit of wiggle room in the self interactions of dark matter. Yeah. Um, how far outside the lambda CDM picture do, um, does SIDM take you? Fantastic. So, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I find it sort of interesting that people talk about uh, self interacting dark matter as as a constraint from a model building standpoint. It's it's actually quite hard to violate 
the limits that you have from observations or self-interactions of dark matter. Uh, to put that in perspective, uh, you know, the, the limits that, for example, you derive from observations of the bullet clusters, so two clusters of galaxies that pass through each other, where, you know, the collision of the component, which is gas, is, you know, collisionally excited and stands in the middle, and the dark matter passes through. Well, those constraints basically tell you that the dark matter cannot be as strongly interacting as proton-proton collisions. And protons are fairly strongly interacting. Uh, and so, you know... Uh, you have roughly constraints on the order of um, on the order of one millibarn per mass of the proton, uh, but a millibarn cross section is is a very large cross section. Uh, but that is that is roughly speaking what the so they're not very strong constraints, but they are you know they, you can build models that violate those. Cool. So getting back to neutrinos, uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up is I want to understand exactly how much of the dark matter we know of. And neutrinos is a part of the dark matter that we know and love or don't love, but they're there. Uh, and so let's calculate how much of the dark matter is known to be in neutrinos. So what you have from this argument is, OK, the relic density of neutrinos scales linear with the mass. We have a lower limit on the mass. Again, these are mass differences, so neutrinos might be more massive, they, they might be, you know, m plus delta m and m, but at a minimum, they are at a mass delta m. And so at a minimum, you have a density of neutrinos that is given by delta m sun plus delta m atmospheric, divided by this number that comes out of standard. And so when you put in the numbers, you get this fairly small thingy. That's a lower limit. That's, that's a bottom, so at least that much. Uh, if you express that in units of the dark matter density, that's very close to half a percent. So we know that at least half a percent of dark matter is in the form of standard model neutrinos. We know that for sure. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that we also have a limit from above. And maybe here is where, you know, your question comes in. Uh, we have limits, direct limits, on uh, the mass of neutrinos from cosmology because Neutrinos are hot dark matter candidates, are hot dark matter particles that tend to disrupt the formation of the density enhancement that cold dark matter produces. And so there cannot be too many of them. Uh, putting in the numbers and marginalizing over a bunch of things, cosmologists have obtained a limit on the sum on neutrino masses that is in that range. Uh, large scale structure data also constraints dark matter. And here the idea is that if you have too much mass in neutrinos, you wipe out small scales. And there are direct ways, uh, probably the best one is Lyman alpha forest data, to constrain clumps uh, of you know, gravitational wells where there's gas, where you can observe this Lyman alpha emission from hydrogen lines. Uh, and so large scale structure tells you that there is this very strong upper limit on the neutrino masses. And so again, if you put that limit into our magic formula, what you get is that you not only have a lower limit on how much the neutrinos contribute to the dark matter, there's also an upper limit. So it's a fairly solid statement that neutrinos are the 1% of the dark matter. Okay, neutrinos are the 1% of the dark matter. Uh, what else do we have? Yes? So is the statement No, no, we know they do. Okay. We are sure that neutrinos are 1% of the dark matter. There's no doubt. Uh, I mean, scientifically speaking, no doubt. Uh, there's, there's very strong evidence, there's very compelling uh, evidence that neutrinos are exactly 1% of the dark matter. They cannot be less. Again, the argument is they cannot be less because neutrinos have mass. They were in thermal equilibrium because they interact with weak interactions. We know exactly how many relic neutrinos in number density there were from the early universe. So once you multiply that number density by their mass, you get this lower limit. But on the other hand, we also know that there cannot be too many neutrinos, uh, or rather, that they cannot be too massive. And so you really know that neutrinos have to be in the 1%. You have a lower and an upper limit. 
So that, you know, to me, is pretty interesting because we know exactly what that much of the dark matter is. And I'm going to tell you more about other things that we know are part of the dark matter. All right? So another thing is planets, right? You've all seen pictures like this. Uh, this is a snapshot of a few, a few of the thousands of extrasolar planets that the Kepler mission has discovered. And so, you know, extrapolating uh, the Kepler results, sort of uh, assuming some sort of a completeness of the survey that is admittedly partial that Kepler carried out, uh, there's evidence that there are between 100 and 400 billion planets in the Milky Way. So now you were saying there's you know, a mass of 10 to the 11 uh, solar masses in the Milky Way. And I said, that's roughly the number of stars, right? So 10 to the 11 is exactly 100 billions. So what that means is that Kepler tells you that pretty much every star in the Milky Way uh, that is worth that name has a planet, all right? So, uh, so good. All right, so what's a big ass planet? Jupiter, all right? So Jupiter is surely a pretty massive guy. Jupiter weighs about a thousandth of the mass of the sun, all right? So let's take 400 Jupiters to get a, an absolute upper limit on how much planets contribute to the dark matter in the Milky Way. 400 Jupiters, and you get four times 10 to the eight solar masses. Now, as I said, the Milky Way mass is about 10 to the 12 solar masses. So, you know, in a galaxy like the Milky Way, which compared to the universe as a whole, contains a lot more planets uh, than the universe as a whole, as far as we know. Uh, so this is an absolute upper limit. Planets cannot make up more than 0.04% of the dark matter. And again, this is an upper limit for a variety of reasons, because planets tend to be lighter than Jupiter, because the Milky Way has a bunch of planets that other smaller galaxies probably don't have, uh, and because the universe is not only made of Milky Ways. There's many other things that don't look like the Milky Way, that don't have stars, and that don't have planets. Okay. So one more thing. One more thing is black holes. Black hole, yes, question. Oh, thanks. Yeah, uh, sorry about, about that. About the last thing. Um, just out of curiosity, what are we looking at in this picture? Do the colors mean anything? And also, what's that like random guy hanging out? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a planetary scientist, so I can tell you that I think the colors are actual colors, so meaning that you know, they reflect the temperature of the planet. Uh, but I don't, maybe that actually is Jupiter, for all I know. But I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah, sorry about that. My, my good friend is, uh, is one of the main persons in Kepler, but uh, not me. Uh, all right, yes, Adi. Yeah. Nah. It's not necessarily the big thing. The thing is, you know, Jupiter is, is pretty close to becoming a star. Okay. So you make Jupiter a little fatter, and it turns into a star. So I don't know if this is probably, you're right, this is probably not Jupiter. I don't know what that is, but yeah, uh, we'll find out later. So let's talk about black holes, which is what I want to talk about in this, in this lecture series. So um, how much do astrophysical black holes contribute to dark matter? And I, you know, before making these lectures, I had no idea. And so here's what I came up with. Uh, so I came up with the fact that a colleague from Italy, Sicilia, uh, calculated that for me pretty accurately. So that's great. Uh, so what they did was the following. Uh, never mind this complicated flow chart. The idea is when you know stars, uh, when you know uh, galaxies, uh, you can get an estimate of how much stars of a given type there are inside a given galaxy at a given redshift. And so you break things up by metallicity, redshift, and type of galaxy. And you integrate over that uh, the possible ways, the possible pathways by which you form black holes out of stars. And there's primarily three pathways. One is you have a big fat star that dies and you know, goes through all the elements up to iron. And then, you know, it just collapses, supernovae, and, uh, and produce a black hole. Another pathway is a so-called failed binary. There are two big stars that collide, and when they merge, their total mass is critical, and they collapse into a black hole. Failed binaries. And there's a third pathway, 
which is, you know, some argue what uh, LIGO is looking at, which is, you know, you have two massive stars, they're in a binary, they both die, become black holes, and then the black holes in the binary eventually merge and form a bigger black hole at the end. Okay, so uh, once you have a way to convolve your galactic models with models that describe how you form black holes, you can calculate the black hole mass function, which tells you, for instance, in this plot, you know, at redshift 10, 8, 6, and so on, uh, what density of black holes per unit logarithmic mass, per unit volume, you have. And so you see that there's different contributors at different masses. Here, you know, you have 100 solar masses, uh, you know, 10 solar masses, and so on. Uh, and so, obviously, as you increase redshift, you pile up more and more black holes. So let's look a little bit in detail uh, in terms of these three pathways that I was talking about. What, uh, you know, what contributes where. And so you see that this uh, single stellar evolution line basically explains the entirety of the really massive black holes. So it is believed that these, you know, 100 solar mass black holes pretty much all derive from the death of massive stars. Uh, failed binaries also contribute uh, to fairly large objects. Uh, and then binaries themselves, of course, populate a little bit more the uh, higher end of the masses, uh, but they're relatively less efficient in the other mechanism at lower mass. Yes? Um, is the idea that the different redshifts that older galaxies will just have more time to form black holes? Yeah. So, so it's just, you know, you pile up things. Uh, and of course, you know, galaxies don't really form stars up to a redshift of what, 60, depending on who you ask. And so at, at redshift 10, you really start producing a lot of black holes, and then you just pile them up on top of each other. So now let's turn the crank, or let Sicilia et al. turn the crank, and that is the bottom line. So this is actually the density in yet another set of units, which is solar masses per megaparsec cube. Um, and in these units, Cold dark matter is 3.3 times 10 to the 10. All right, so let's, let's go back to the estimate we made before. So uh, a megaparsec is roughly the size of a cluster of galaxies. And a cluster of galaxies we, we saw in the slide before contains about 10 to the 15 solar masses. So an overdensity corresponding to a cluster of galaxy is 10 to the 15 in those units. Now, the other thing that I alluded to is that the Milky Way has an overdensity of roughly 10 to the 6. Clusters are a little less steep, so it's roughly 10 to the 5. And in fact, you get the 10 to the 10 from here, right? Cluster density, 10 to the 15, is 100,000 times this critical density. Okay, just to wrap our head around solar masses and megaparsecs. That's kind of the scale. Okay, so we are up there. That's the cold dark matter density they were shooting for. Now, all stars, which believe it or not, are dark matter. Cosmologically, stars behave like dark matter because they're pressureless, collisionless fluid. So they do contribute to the dark matter. How much of it? Probably one and a half percent. Okay, that's you know slightly uncertain. It depends on a variety of things. But what I wanted to bring home is that stellar black holes that obviously have to be a fraction, a small fraction of stars are about 0.15% of the dark matter. And again, this is not an exact number, but you know, the exact number is going to be fairly close to that. All right. Yes, Adi. How do we expect this to change as we evolve further? What do you mean as we evolve further in knowledge or? In time? Yeah. Well, so, okay. So my 12-year-old son always embarrasses me because he asks me really good questions. And he told me, if we wait infinitely long, it's all going to be black holes. And I, I didn't know what to answer. Probably there's going to be a lot of black holes. You know, eventually, most of this stuff might go up close to the stellar density. However, I don't think that everything will collapse into a black hole. You know, stuff will become cold, but the universe will just become very boring. 
Ah, my son didn't really like that. He, he wanted the exciting thing of falling into a black hole. But yeah. Um, kind of related, as the universe evolves to have more black holes yeah. and there's more Hawking radiation, is the percentage of baryonic matter going to change? Oh, uh, we'll get to Hawking radiations. None of these black holes radiates at all because okay. they're a lot colder than the CMB. Now, as the universe cools, uh, you know, the black holes will become relatively hotter. And so at some point, they might start to radiate, but they radiate very, very inefficiently. So, yes. They're not dark, but what is the dark matter? So the dark matter is, in a cosmological sense, is a pressureless, collisionless fluid. So if you take stars, uh, stars per se, if you have a gas of stars, uh, that gas is pressureless and collisionless. Because collisions with stars, you know, it's, it's a very easy blackboard problem to convince yourself that they're very, very rare. Uh, so it's essentially collisionless. And they don't have pressure because they're very slow. You know, they don't push each other around. Uh, and so from the standpoint of structure formation, uh, stars behave exactly like the dark matter. So dynamically, you know, as an ingredient to cosmology, stars are part of the dark matter. So when you make like a measurement of the amount of dark matter, so it's only for large scale structures? Yeah, so inevitably, inevitably you're counting the effect of stars. Now, the thing is, you can subtract it off. You know, in, in nearby systems, like dwarf galaxies, we do observe directly stars. We measure the motion of stars, and that's how we determine the gravitational potential wells of the dark matter. But it's not really of the dark matter. It's of everything that behaves like the dark matter. So it includes stars. The point is, in dwarf galaxies, you can still observe stars and subtract them off um, of the counting that you're making of what behaves like the dark matter. There's a question there, and then I come back to you. Yes. Yes, so this is 1.5% of cold dark matter today. The mass density of stars is, roughly speaking, uh, on the scale of the universe, 1.5% of, of what we call cosmological dark matter. Yes, so of course stars didn't exist right. at CMB. But the, at, yeah. The that it's not yeah. Well, okay. So what I mean here is that today, in the universe today, a mass equivalent to 1.5% of the non baryonic cold dark matter is in stars, and it behaves exactly like cold dark matter today. So it's sort of added on, if you want, uh, to the amount of non-baryonic cold dark matter that you measure at CMB and BBN. Uh, but today, in the late universe, stars do behave, unlike, say, baryonic clouds, stars do behave exactly like non-baryonic cold dark matter. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Uh, first. Yeah. Uh, I yes. So like, the, the, by your definition, the mass fraction that's true. Okay. Yes. Certain things start hot and relativistic. They become less hot and less relativistic. And today, they add on to that. And so what I refer to as of CDM is the CDM that you measure in your universe. Uh, okay. but, but today, there is a little bit more of a fluid that behaves in exactly the same way. Yes? When you say that it behaves exactly like non baryonic dark matter, mm -hmm. I would think that maybe there's one distinction, which is that we can see, we can see mm -hmm. stars. Um, so if we were to say, you know, just do the most obvious, ridiculous thing, which is just look out and say, I'm going to count all the things I can see, mm -hmm. and then put them in this column, and then all the things I can't see, and put them in this column and subtract them off, right? Wouldn't how can we consider the stars to be a part of the, when I, when I think of what we talk about as dark matter, I think yeah. about it as being the non-visible. And dark also means that it, it 
can't see it. So in this context, when we say that, how, how have we not already also counted the stars in the visible part? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, and the reason is that, OK, here, what I call CDM, of CDM is of the number of cold dark matter that early in the universe uh, we measured with CMB and BBN that helped the formation of structure. And then you know, subsequently you form stars, you form planets, you form black holes. And all those things in the late universe end up behaving exactly the same way as that sort of primordial cold dark matter. So in other words, you don't have any dynamical way to distinguish that new, if you want, component of cold dark matter from the primordial one. Uh, so while you're absolutely right that stars, you know, we see them, we can subtract off stars uh, when we try to estimate how much dark matter of the primordial genre there is in the system. Uh, and yet, you know, from the standpoint of what dynamically those stars do in the system, they do exactly the same thing as cold dark matter does. Hopefully, I'm not confusing things here. Good. Great. Uh, very good. So there's one last thing, which is supermassive black holes. Supermassive black holes are also probably forming very late in the game. Uh, we don't know exactly how. Uh, they also behave like cold dark matter at late times. But they're a very, very small component of however much primordial cold dark matter existed in the early universe. Supermassive black hole? Well, supermassive black holes, we, we can estimate the number out of direct observations of the correlation between galaxy size and the size of the supermassive black holes they host uh, from a variety of, of observations. OK, good. So um, <laughs> let's now go back to the question of uh, the primordial dark matter, the dark matter that is not made of stuff that was not behaving like dark matter in the early universe. Uh, and, and I'm sure you know, uh, you've talked, you, you've heard that dark matter has to be a new elementary particle. And so to me, you know, when a statement like that is made, uh, I believe it's very important to understand exactly what we mean by an elementary particle. And an elementary particle is technically that. Now, you know, if, if, if you're going on a date and your date asks you, what do you do? <laughs> I'm a particle physicist. Oh, cool. What is an elementary particle? You know, that's a great way to completely destroy the date, to say that, you know, well, it's an irreducible, you know, representation, unitary representation of the Poincaré group. Now, that might not mean much, but actually, this statement, which is known as Wigner's representation theorem, is actually very profound. And Adi knows that, because uh, at his oral exam, you talked exactly about this. Uh, so the, the Wigner theorem tells you that any elementary particle is in one-to-one -one correspondence with two numbers that explain what happens when you apply a Poincaré transformation to the elementary particle. And so we know that generators of the Poincaré group are the generators of translations, rotations, and boosts. Uh, and in fact, given an elementary particle, you only need to specify its mass when it comes to you know, qualify what happens under translations, right? the inertia that the particle has to a linear uh, uh, motion. And then, of course, under rotation, what matters is the representation uh, of spin. And so you have a continuum number, m, a real number, and an integer or semi-integer number, uh, which corresponds to the spin of the particle that tells you how the particle transforms and the rotations. Uh, now, in the dark matter, we actually do know something about both the mass and the spin. Not much, but something. So uh, one thing we do know about the mass is that if you take the dark matter particle mass to be very small, uh, and you calculate the de Broglie wavelength, the results from that mass, uh, when the dark matter inhabits systems like dwarf galaxies, where the velocity dispersion is very low, it's about 10 kilometers per second or so, uh, then you can calculate precisely when quantum effects get in the way of gravitational collapse. So in other words, when, you know, in this case, Bose pressure uh, prevents 
the stability of gravitationally bound objects like dwarf galaxies. And so if you put in the numbers, all you need to know is the uncertainty principle, right? So all you need to know is that the de Broglie wavelength, so Planck's constant divided by the mass of the particle times the velocity that is typical of this system, has to be smaller. The quantum size of the particle has to be smaller than the physical size of the object that you observe being gravitationally collapsed, all right? And so if you put in the numbers, uh, what you get uh, is that for a mass of one electron volt, uh, you know, the de Broglie wavelength corresponding to velocities of dwarf galaxies is about this much, is about a third of a centimeter, all right? And so you, you can take that to be as large as a kiloparsec that is three times 10 to the 21, which means that the limit on the mass of the particle is the inverse of a kiloparsec in centimeters. So another good number to have in mind. So this is sort of an absolute lower limit, uh, right? Because you cannot prevent uh, quantum pressure, right? Quantum pressure has to be there. We know the velocity, we know the mass, and there's no way around this. It holds even in a case of Bose-Einstein condensates, pretty much without any correction. Okay, so the dark matter, if it is a boson, if you can squeeze as large number densities as you please, uh, then you have an absolute lower limit of 10 to the negative 22 electron volts. Now, if your spin J in your Wigner's theorem is half integer, then what happens is you have a harder time packing large number densities of particles in the same place. And so the best you can do is you can hit sort of the Pauli blocking limit. So that means is, you know, if your dark matter has G internal degrees of freedom, its phase space density, its phase space density, so the product of the physical density, the number density, and the momentum space density has to be smaller than the number of degrees of freedom divided by h cubed, right? That's your stat Mach 101 right there. So it wasn't entirely useless. It was almost entirely useless, but not quite. Uh, and so, you know, what you can do is you can look at a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, which probably describes the equilibrium uh, momentum distribution of your dark matter. If you know there's some sort of thermal equilibrium, uh, this is your velocity dispersion. And uh, what results out of this is a limit in the case of fermions that is a good 24 orders of magnitude stronger than for bosons. So it's really a lot harder to pack fermions uh, in place. So here you go. Of course, in my set of lectures, I ain't gonna be talking about these light guys. What I'm gonna be talking about is the other end of the spectrum. So really heavy, heavy dudes. And on the other end of the spectrum, as we'll see in greater detail later on, uh, what happens is you kind of break down the notion that the dark matter behaves like a fluid, right? So what do we call a fluid? A fluid is a substance that can be described by a pressure and a density, and therefore where you can give up the notion that there exists individual constituents, right? That's what we imagine fluid to be. We forget about the little particles. We treat it as one giant microscopic thing that has a density and a pressure. All right, so when you lose the fluid description because your individual objects become large compared to the typical size of astronomical objects, such as globular clusters or disk galaxies, then what happens is you tidally disrupt these objects, right? Because you have enough gravity in your point-like dark matter particle to cause warps in disks or to sort of shoot through a globular cluster and see the tidal tail, the tidal disruption of the globular cluster. And so, again, Adi, you know, if, if you have a 10 to the 5 solar mass thing, there's very few of them, right? In a 10 to the 8 solar mass, um, dwarf galaxy, you have a thousand particles that weigh 10 to the five. So those are few particles. Uh, and you might ask, well, you know, can I still create uh, a stable object like that? Uh, and the answer is no, 10 to the five is way too much. So in fact, the upper limit is, you know, in the hundreds to thousands of solar masses. Okay, heavier than that, you essentially resolve 
you essentially resolve tidally the effects of individual particles, particles of dark matter. So, uh, so that's kind of the spectrum that we have in mind. 10 to the negative 22, macroscopic quantum effects. Again, here the idea, you've got a de Broglie wavelength, the size, I see your hand, the size of dwarf galaxies. And on the other hand, you have macroscopic tidal effects that warp disks, that disrupt globular clusters. And in the same units, you've got about 92 orders of magnitude, which I'm sure you all have heard of. Right, so the point of making this discussion is for me to put things in perspective. But I'm going to take your question first. Uh, thanks. Um, just a really general question. Why yeah. can't dark matter be composite? Yeah, it can be a composite. And if it is a composite, it still has to fall here. Okay. okay? If it is a composite and it weighs more than that, it ain't game. You cannot have that. Because again, you would see the tidal effects. So composites, you know, we, we get to composites. They live here. But they, they are on this scale. Addy. Um, I was somewhere on here with the Planck scale. Oh, yeah. You, we'll get there. So after that, we, you're saying tidal effects. And generally, um, we would think that those would be disruptions in crystal terms. And so why, why do we believe we know that it's going to act like the way we know it's going to act? Yeah, because you know, space time, not too far away from black hole, is very boring. You know, that's, that's a short answer. So it doesn't really matter what, uh, what a black hole looks like uh, close to its event horizon. You know, two or three Schwarzschild radii away, everything looks the same. Yes? Uh, just to follow up to yeah. the composite particle question. You said um, composite particles sort of live in this upper range, yep. but why couldn't they live in the lower range? Oh, yeah. They can live, you know, OK, fine. Uh, <laughs> you know, composites of what? Uh, if you talk about composites of standard model particles, then probably you're talking about stuff that is in this range, right? Because the proton is around here. And so composites, you know, will be somewhere around here. Uh, macroscopic composites, like, you know, planets and stuff like that, live over here. Uh, and, you know, and we'll see where black holes live, but also on that right hand side of the spectrum. And what about uh, composites of dark matter or dark sector? Particles? Yeah. Then, you know, then uh, everything is game, pretty much. Everything is game, yeah. Cool. So, of course, as you know very well, we have a love story uh, within this large landscape that is uh, the weak scale, right? Uh, and there's many reasons why people have invested careers, many, many millions of dollars to look for WIMPs. Uh, there's, you know, very, very good reasons to do so. But... If you put things in perspective, <laughs> if you put that plot in scale, it actually looks like that. All right, so, you know, I think it's, you know, myself, I have devoted decades of my scientific career to this plot, right? I've, you know, I've prayed on this plot for many nights uh, in vain. But, uh, so here we are. You know, it's certainly, you know, dark matter, as far as we know, is definitely not there. And, and we are brushing against, you know, really hard experimental questions. I'm not going to talk about any of this. I'm not going to talk about whether or not the galactic center axis comes from any of this, the positron axis. You know, you can go out and read papers, including my papers. The point is, we are looking at a very thin sliver of this parameter space. Now, let's talk about a Planck scale, Adi. So this, this cheerful German here, Mr. Planck, sort of divides... Uh, you know, like Julius Caesar said that Gallia is divided into four parts. Dark matter models are divided into two parts. And one part is the part where the Planck scale is bigger than the mass of the particle. And we talk about quantum particles. And we talk about uh, this, M and J. And then there is the Planck scale. So what happens to the Planck scale? How do, you, how do we think about the Planck scale? So when I think about the Planck scale, I think about the following. So take a measure of quantum effects. And the perfect measurement of quantum effects is the Compton wavelength, right? You have a particle of mass m. What is its quantum size? Well, everything you can do is to take fundamental constants and turn them into a distance. And so you take the mass, you put it downstairs, h over mc. That's the 
quantum size of the particle mass m. All right, that's actually different from what I was talking about before, because the velocity I was talking about before was the velocity inside a dwarf galaxy, which is much smaller than c. But in natural units, that is the relevant quantum length. Okay, now let's talk about black holes. I'm sure everyone in this room has heard of the Schwarzschild radius, right? The Schwarzschild radius is defined in terms of fundamental units, uh, g newton, and the velocity c of light by this combination. Now, what is, what is the mass at which the Compton wavelength of the particle and its Schwarzschild radius are exactly the same? That is the Planck scale. So the Planck scale is literally, or can be literally defined as the mass where the Schwarzschild radius corresponding to the mass equals the Compton wavelength corresponding to the mass. Okay, if you wanna convince yourself, you just put stuff in. You take Schwarzschild radius, 2gm over c squared, you express it in units of the Planck scale, which is defined as such, and how you get the Compton wavelength corresponding to the Planck scale. Okay, so the Planck scale tells you that if you go bigger, quantum effects are smaller than the Schwarzschild radius. So it's kind of like, you know, quantum mechanics is now inside the event horizon. So it kind of, you know, clearly delimits the realm where general relativity kicks in, right? In a very, in a very visual way to me. So that's the Planck scale. So my lectures uh, are going to be all about uh, transplankian dark matter candidates. So dark matter candidates that have to do with mass scales beyond the Planck scale. And uh, I don't have to tell you that this is a pretty special time in the history of science to think about uh, objects beyond the Planck scale, namely black holes. You know, we have direct imaging of black holes, now of two black holes, our own Psi J star and the M87 star in the center of uh, the Virgo cluster. Uh, there's, of course, you know, been many, many, many tens, if not hundreds these days, uh, gravitational wave events coming from mergers of a variety of systems, uh, mostly pairs of massive black holes. Uh, so we are really, you know, entering in an era where I think it makes a lot of sense about, you know, to think about black holes a little more seriously. And I'll, I'll give you a sense historically of how things were in flux. Uh, with the notion of black holes uh, in these last five minutes. So, uh, okay, so here's just a, a small preview before getting to, so we're gonna talk about all sorts of black holes. We're gonna talk about grain of salt black holes. The Planck scale is about a grain of salt. It's 10 micrograms. So it's microscopic, it's really cool. If you have a grain of salt, that's about how a Planck mass weighs. It's 10 micrograms. Uh, Ton-sized black holes, those are very light, they evaporate away, and they could do all sorts of interesting things. They could do baryogenesis, they can create the dark matter, uh, or both. Uh, I'm gonna talk about slightly more massive black holes that I call evanescent black holes. Uh, we'll calculate that the lifetime of a black hole is equal to the age of the universe for 10 to the 15 grams. And that's uh, roughly the mass of the pyramids of Giza. Right. If black holes are lighter than that, they're gone. Uh, if they're a little bit heavier, they're still giving off uh, Hawking radiation at a very precise temperature, the MEV, the mega electron volt. Yes? I put it probably a ridiculous question. There's no ridiculous question. Um, I often hear uh, people talking about the and they never seem to really believe what they're saying, but they also always mention it. And I wonder if anybody's ever calculated like the possibility of like, you know, remnants from evaporated. Oh yeah, we'll talk about that. Okay. And you're looking at somebody who has taken them very seriously. Okay. Sorry, I'll tell you how to detect them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you how to detect them. So the idea here that, that she has in mind is, you know, we'll talk about Hawking evaporation. Hawking evaporation is a semi-classical process. And so it breaks down when quantum gravity kicks in because it literally you know, lives where quantum field theory and sort of the weak form of general relativity coexist. But as soon as you are in a purely quantum gravitational regime, which means you're close to Planck scale, there's no guarantee that uh, 
uh, Hawking evaporation will hold. And so there's that reason to believe that you might have a remnant of evaporation of black holes. There's other reasons that I will talk about. One of them is that in the process of Hawking evaporation, you sometimes emit positively charged particles, sometimes negatively charged particles. And it so turns out that if you have a remnant charge of about 10 units, and your mass is the Planck scale, that your black hole essentially vanishes. Rather, it becomes extremal. So the uh, horizon of the black hole contracts to zero. Evaporation stops by definition, because the black hole doesn't have a horizon. And so you know, if you have a significant remnant electric charge, evaporation stops as well, without even invoking quantum gravity. Uh, and the beauty of that is that then you're stuck with these Planck scale charged particles. And I can tell you exactly how to look for them if you're interested. Um, anyways, we'll then talk about the more classic primordial black holes, which have masses much larger, all the way up to the LIGO masses, where you know, famously folks at Johns Hopkins have hypothesized that they could be part or the dark matter, and so on. So I'm running out of time. So what we're going to do uh, tomorrow is we're going to talk about what a black hole is. And a black hole really was conceptually discovered by a priest in England in 1783, when this country was seven years old. Uh, and what John Mitchell said was, well, let's, let's look at the escape velocity. Let's look at the escape velocity of an object with a mass m at a distance d from the object. Right? And let's imagine that, and you know, we know how to calculate this. Our kindergarten teacher you know, went to the board and calculated at some point when we were five years old the escape velocity, and that's the result she found. Right? You all, you all guys remind me. So uh, if you squeeze enough mass m in a small enough space d, eventually your escape velocity gets to the speed of light. It's just a matter of pushing and pushing and pushing. And so Reverend John Mitchell said, well, if a body exists such that I manage to squeeze enough mass in a small enough radius that VE is greater than C, then its light could never reach us. And of course, here the picture that people had in mind, uh, including Laplace, who was the second person who formulated this, the picture they had in mind was one where light was made up of corpuscules, of, of little particles, right? And so, uh, you know, it's not that trivial when you actually use a proper treatment of what, you know, gravity does to light rays, but, you know, the idea was fundamentally correct. The idea was fundamentally correct. Black holes correspond to objects where, uh, you know, at a point called the event horizon, the escape velocity uh, equals the speed of light. Therefore, light cannot escape. Uh, and this, again, is an idea almost as old as this country. And I'm going to stop here for tonight. Thank you. More questions, I'll be here, I'll stick around. Okay, uh, Adi. This, I, it's a stupid question, but it's always confusing me because you're saying speed of light, yeah. and then I see no gammas or anything in there, and so I don't know how that's, how we're saying that's valid. So um, could you help me make sense of that? Why, why should there be a gamma? I mean, because you're, you're defining from the reference frame of the actual, uh, yeah. Uh, the, sorry, the, the black yeah, yeah. or whatever. So you, 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 you're, you're talking about yeah. something else moving in a frame relative to it, right?